Hello students, welcome to the channel and hope you all are happy and healthy there. Have you ever wondered, whenever you are feeling depressed, you are asked to take a deep breath. You know why? You are feeling some huge amount of air in the chest and then you feel relaxed. You are asked to repeat it again and again. Then you feel relieved from anxiety up to some extent. Well, uh, if you wonder, there is a science behind that. What is that? Your body actually needs a lot of oxygen. When supply of oxygen is less, you feel shortage of energy. Due to which your brain gets little irritated with the, you know, like the present situation. In such case, what happens? It stops working little and when it stops working, you feel like darkness around you. So that's why at that moment, you are asked to take a deep breath. When you take a deep breath, you capture a lot of oxygen from the air and then you allow your um, respiratory system to carry this oxygen to the different parts of your body. Then this oxygen is carried by hemoglobin, which is a, a hemo oxygen carrier and it goes to the different parts of your body. There it diffuses into the cell and in the cell it uh, uh, resumes uh, uh, the energy production process, right? So the previous topic which you had learned that has a great connection with this topic which today we are about to see. As you see the upper cover, it's clearly uh, visible. We are going to see <coughs> the topic transportation, right? So it's uh, another uh, life process in the class 10 biology. So welcome to this uh, class once again and uh, thanks for your feedback uh, of the previous topic. It uh, brings about a lot of improvements and motivation to put up such videos once again and again, right? So let's see what is with us with now. Dear students, transportation and human beings is the topic which is uh, primarily we have to look after. Before we go ahead, ever you have uh, tried this activity, visit a health center in your locality and uh, find out what is the normal range of hemoglobin content in human beings. The pathologist there, they will take a blood sample and they will get a differential count of it and they will let you know what is the uh, normal range of hemoglobin content in your body. Is it the same for children and adults? Is there any difference in the hemoglobin levels for men and women? Visit a veterinary clinic also in your locality. Find out what is the normal range of hemoglobin content in an animal like the buffalo or cow. Is this content different in calves, male and female animals? Now you have to gather this information, collect this data, prepare a table, comparative study can be done, compare the difference seen in male and female uh, human beings and animals. Once you do this, you will get uh, your eyes open towards what we are going to study today. All right. This actually uh, you will come to know how would the difference uh, be there and if any be explained right so what is the requirement of uh, the hemoglobin how much is the requirement of hemoglobin and how much it should be there in what gender in what uh, and family in what kingdom in what kind of species that's all what you have to first gather your information it may be virtual it may be a uh, physical also so let's find out to get our information clear right so dear students when we learn about the transportation in human beings, generally transportation in human beings is not a simple process. If you happen to see the movement or transportation of materials in amoeba, paramecium, these animals are made up of one cell, right? Due to this one cell body mechanism, they have a simple process that is called diffusion. Similarly, in simple plants also the same diffusion can happen, right? But as and when the size 
the plant body design, the animal body design, number of cells, when it incre when increase, then uh, the mode of transportation has to change, right? And from the cellular level, it has to shift towards the organ system level. From the simple level, it has to shift to a little complex level, right? So here, um, in our body, like we are trying to understand uh, the transportation in human beings. So in human beings, that organ system which is involved in transportation of materials across our body is actually called circulatory system. Now let me uh, make you a little uh, enriched in this case. What is it transported? What is transported? Raw material for the factories or the clothes? No. What is transported in our body is actually your food materials, oxygen to the cells, carbon dioxide from away from the cells waste materials from the body to out of the body nutrients which are absorbed in the nutrition process then um, then energy which is to be produced that energy has to be also generated and transported towards all of the body so how it will happen this happens through a pretty a well organized dynamic circulatory system now that circulatory system has some components right now what is that component that component you can see here that human beings like other animals which are multicellular organisms need a regular supply of food oxygen etc and this function is performed by circulatory system circulatory system in human beings consists of following three things out of which one is another fourth also you can say three branches can be uh, given to this number one is your heart this is the primary organ of the circulatory system heart now heart needs some helpful organs that helpful organs are blood vessels two blood vessels are important over here to note down one is arteries and other is veins generally arteries and veins are also subsidiarily or auxiliarily helped by capillaries too so there is there are three kinds of blood vessels altogether arteries veins and capillaries since major blood vessels are arteries and veins so mentioned here other than that there is a fluid which provides a medium for transportation of oxygen or transportation of food or waste or wherever whatever the gas you are tra transporting throughout your body that needs a medium that medium is given by two body fluids in your uh, circulatory system one that moves in the blood vessel is the blood and another that moves in a lymphatic vessel that is lymph okay so these are the three organs or tissues which you can say as the components of this organ system that is called circulatory system let us have a light upon the different components one by one a uh, heart we will decide in the separate uh, portions let's go with the blood right now blood is a fluid connective tissue all of you have re to recall the concept of class 9 chapter tissue so in that you learn that blood is a fluid connective tissue it contains two components one is the granular component other is the liquid component granular components contain cells corpuscles like rbc wbc platelets these are the cellular components which create a granular um, um, structure to the blood so these are kept under the granular component they are blood corpuscles other than that there is a liquid component it is the highest in composition so that's liquid component is plasma right so here blood corpuscles namely red blood corpuscles which are called rbcs these are also called erythrocyte if you recall concept of class 9 tissues blood platelets which are thrombocytes which you recall again wbc which are called leukocytes 
So what does RBC do? RBCs carry gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. They contain HB, HB for hemoglobin. It's an iron protein which impart red color to the blood. On the other hand, blood platelets, they help in blood clotting. Uh, WBCs, they are white blood corpuscles, provide body defense by engulfing the germs and producing antibodies. They are like border security forces of our body right on the other hand liquid component liquid components contain plasma now this plasma has the highest percentage of water in it that's 90 percent is water out of this water and apart from this water and there are 10 percent organic substances like plasma protein uh, albumin globulin inorganic substances like mineral ions these all substances are completely making up the liquid component of blood. Dear students, if these blood and fluid connective tissues are transported, they must be transported through some tunnels, through canal or any channel, ho. So these are called vessels, blood vessels. What are those? Now the blood vessels called arteries, what do they carry? They generally, it is written here, carry oxygenated blood from heart to body parts. But pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated also. So what you can remember here is, they carry blood towards the different parts of the body away from the heart, right? This is the prime functions. They are called distributing vessel. Yes, they carry blood from the heart to the different parts of the body. So this is called distribution of blood. So they are called distributing vessel. They are actually thick and elastic. Yes, because the pressure of blood coming from the pumping organ that is heart is high. So to bear it, there, some, there must be some thickness in the wall to bear that that pressure apart from that to also withstand that pressure they must be having some elasticity to avoid any bursting of the blood vessel so that's why they are thick and elastic they are deep seated means you cannot see these vessels from outside the skin where opposite to it they there are veins veins carry deoxygenated blood from the body parts to the heart since they, um, there are also some other veins which are carrying oxygenated blood from the uh, body parts to the heart. So that is pulmonary vein, right? On the other hand, they are called collecting vessel. Yes, they collect blood from different parts of the body and give it to the heart for processing, okay? On the other hand, since uh, their pressure is less, blood pressure in the veins is less because it is coming from the different parts of the body so it comes slowly the pressure is less so they don't require that much thick and elastic pro property so thickness is less elasticity is also less in them all right on the other hand you can also observe that they are superficial compared to arteries yes they can be visible from outside those are seen under the skin and you can generally trace where is our, uh, where is veins so the veins are actually used to take up the, some blood from um, their veins only and they are for for testing purpose when the blood test is done so generally it comes from the veins only dear children blood is one t uh, one fluid another one important thing you have to understand that sometimes what happens uh, some yellowish uh, fluid escapes from the blood capillaries into the intercellular spaces into the intercellular spaces and that in that actually contains less protein than the blood that fluid which escapes that contains little less protein than the blood actually what happens this is also uh, it, it, its color is also somewhat like plasma only but still it flows in the different uh, vessel and that vessel is actually called lymphatic vessel so they flow from the tissues to the heart and they assist in the transportation and also in destroying germs so they are also helping in boosting our immunity okay students so these 
two important components blood vessels blood and lymph have been discussed here right now it's our uh, um, further sequence if you carry on then we have to study about heart now i hope this concept is totally clear let's see another one here our heart is actually a pumping organ so we have written our pump now if you ever go to a cycle tire repairing shop there if you happen to observe or whenever you also pump air into the tire of your bicycle you just notice your movement your motion is actually similar to that of the movement of your heart you once you see the virtual uh, picture of uh, what how does heart pump blood you can see that's how you pump air in the tire of your bicycle that's why we are writing pump for the heart heart is a pumping organ what is the description about heart here heart is a muscular pumping organ divided into four chambers human heart i am talking about the human heart and one more family uh, class of the um, vertebrate family a vertebrate phylum chordata there is four chambers in the heart we will see in the later part of this chapter my dear students the heart is a muscular pumping organ divided into four chambers it's located in the chest cavity is located in the middle of the chest cavity and its alignment is towards left side it's almost the size is almost of your fist if you close your fist with the thumb between with the thumb between index and middle finger coming out that's how you can compare the presence of your heart this heart has got four chambers upper two chambers are called atria or auricles while the lower two chambers are called ventricles left and right sides of the heart are separated by a guiding wall that guiding wall is nothing but called septum right right auricles and ventricles are separated by a tricuspid valve this valve always alternately opens and closes as and when blood is pumped from upper chamber to the lower chamber so this valve is important to uh, block the backward flow of blood right so like uh, the septum is separating the impure blood from pure blood oxygenated and deoxygenated bloods are actually separated by this dividing wall i will uh, i would like to under make you underline here something that right side of the heart is filled with deoxygenated blood while the left side of the blood is actually filled up with the oxygenated blood oxygenated blood my dear students so who will separate this oxygenated and deoxygenated blood this will be separated by the guiding wall that is called septum but when the blood from the artery goes to sorry auricle goes to the ventricle that also has to be separated so that is separated by tricuspid valve on the other hand left auricles and the ventricles are separated by a bicuspid valve here one more thing outer wall by which this heart is surrounded this outer pericardium this pericardium is broad you can see the broader uh, uh, red colored filled up that whole body uh, pericardium is the fit that is called the body also and that works as a shock absorber for the whole heart this heart muscle is called cardiac muscle because it has a rhythmic movement that's what you had learnt in class 9 so this pericardium is filled up with the pericardial fluid if you happen to that upper wall where the upper chambers uh, are surrounding wall is little that means i am talking about the auricular wall auricular wall is actually little thin but the ventricular wall is little thicker so ventricular wall is thicker than auricular wall in order to bear the blood pressure 
which blood pressure from what whenever the blood is poured from uh, auricle it, it goes with the pressure right so it goes with some pressure that pressure has to be borne by somebody so who will bear that pressure that pressure is actually borne by which uh, this one you can see this in this picture you can see this picture here this upper part this upper part is actually no, upper part is actually narrow and the lower part is is little broad so the lower part is broad means what this lower part is broad that means it is uh, helping in bearing the pressure uh, which uh, is exerted by the blood while coming from the auricle okay so hope this uh, brief uh, description of a structure is clear to you all let's observe this uh, diagram over here here the uh, there is vena cava vena cava is the word for veins which receive blood from the um, body parts so there is a superior vena cava which is upper body which is uh, receiving blood from head and other regions on the other hand there is a lower body vena cava which receives blood from the uh, shoulder and below that and right atrium receives blood or left atrium gives blood right so in this way we will we will see this here this is the study of introduction to our pump that is heart hope it's clear to all of you let's see how does our heart work our heart is actually a very dynamic organ my dear students if you happen to uh, observe your body when you run when you do any rigorous exercise you have actually um, you have ob wonder your heart becomes beats faster than in the normal case why does it do so this beating of a heart is actually depending upon amount of oxygen you are giving to it giving it to your body the more oxygen your body demands the more faster this heart should beat and as it beats faster the more energy is being transported to your body so that's why and sometimes what happens uh, some shocking news also makes your heart beat faster that is also one kind of treatment to your body that body demands that time your brain gets anxious to avoid that anxiety your body needs more energy more energy through more oxygen so that's why your heart pumps blood to carry more oxygen to the different parts of your body so let's have a look how does our heart work my dear students if you check out this picture this is your heart in this heart first of all you are receiving or giving blood to the heart how superior and inferior vena cava there are two veins in your body out of which superior vena cava brings blood from upper part of the body while inferior vena cava carries blood from the lower part of the body they give blood to the right auricle of your heart so right auricle of your heart receives this blood slowly and gradually what happens actually this receiving is possible by expansion of the expansion of the upper chamber as and when this blood is filled up in the right auricle then it happens to contract as it contracts the pressure of this blood opens the valve opens the right uh, valve that this tricuspid valve when this tricuspid valve opens the blood with a chapa kind of means it splashes down it goes down in a, with a uh, the, with a good pressure right good deal of pressure that goes down to the that goes down to the uh, ventricle so now ventricle has to expand right ventricle has expanded and at the same time the auricle has contracted auricle contraction leads to the flow of blood to the ventricle now the blood has gone and as soon as the blood goes down the tricuspid valve has to close otherwise it can backflow so backflow can cause problem right so this blood when goes to the right ventricle the ventricle now after a few seconds or within the fraction of second the ventricle has to contract now when the ventricle contracts it contracts with a good pressure with the pressure itna hona chahiye, so that this blood can go to the lungs now the blood has to go to the lungs because it is deoxygenated blood and there you have breathed oxygen in oxygen has come to the alveoli 
which has which is waiting for this blood so this deoxygenated blood has to go to the alveoli of the respiratory system okay so through the pulmonary artery the pulmonary artery will carry this blood to the lungs so you can see the arrow mark very clearly visible very clearly visible here very clearly visible in this you can see this whole world is uh, arrow mark is showing this arrow mark so this arrow mark shows that the blood has to go to the go to the lungs through what pulmonary arteries now there the deoxygenated blood is converted into the oxygenated why because from this blood carbon dioxide is taken out and oxygen is given via process of diffusion okay so that alveoli um, in the alveoli carbon dioxide is taken so that it can be expelled out through the same uh, tracheal system and oxygen is given to the blood and it goes to the cell so then once the blood has been oxygenated this blood is now sent back to the left auricle now the contraction of left auricle sorry the, now this the after the contraction of ventricle blood goes to the lungs then the auricle expands so left auricle when expands then it receives blood from the lungs through another vein that is pulmonary vein this pulmonary veins and arteries are um, described in the difference between arteries and vein in the first slide where you had to see that they are exception carrying deoxygenated or oxygenated blood ag against their property okay of the property of veins and arteries so they are receiving blood the pulmonary veins receive carry this blood to the uh, uh, left auricle or atrium atrium is the singular word for atria so this blood now comes and at the same time auricle contracts auricle contracts the pressure is built built upon what upon the valve bicuspid valve now this bicuspid valve opens up when the bicuspid valve opens they fall the blood splashes down into the ventricle left ventricle now after some time the left ventricle expanded and this expansion causes the space for the blood when the after it receives the blood it contracts again so when it contracts it contracts with a great pressure and that pressure is so much high that it with the one pump only the blood has to go to the different parts of your body it is actually estimated that it is more than 500 km per hour otherwise it will not reach out to the brain blood will not but it will take a long time for the blood to reach from the tip of the toe to the brain also throughout the body so for that purpose the art this uh, arterial pressure is very high so the this heart um, the lower chamber ventricle is actually thicker for this purpose only to bear this pressure so this pumping is very far, very uh, very strong pumping takes place here when the strong pumping takes place then this blood goes to the uh, through the aorta the biggest artery of your circulatory system you can see you can see this the aorta is the biggest artery and this aorta carries blood to the different parts of your body okay you can also see that arterial walls are thicker in comparison to the vein wall why because the blood which is um, coming up from the heart is coming up with a great speed the great speed causes great pressure so to bear that pressure on the wall of artery that pressure has to be built by artery only right borne by the artery only so pressure exerted by blood on the arterial wall is called blood pressure later on you will come to know what is blood pressure that generally this blood pressure should not be too low this blood pressure should not be too high because both of these are injurious for your health well if you happen to see what kind of circulation your body does right your body has to uh, you will see that you can see this network like thing you can see this network like thing this network and this network both that networks are called capillaries okay students you can see this right half of the entire circulatory system is filled up with your uh, deoxygenated blood and the left half is entirely filled up with the oxygenated blood right so in this case you will see there is the movement of blood from the heart to the lungs this picture is very clearly showing you throughout your body 
I think this uh, can be depicted with the help of this flow chart. If you remember this flow chart, it will be easy for you to understand entire movement of the blood throughout your circulatory system. I keep this in front of you to visualize and memorize. It's simple. First, you have to remember the numberings. The pulmonary veins, where is the pulmonary vein? This, then oxygenated blood. Right atrium is receiving the blood. The right ventrium is sending the blood to the right ventricle from the right ventricle this goes to this goes to this goes to the lungs now from the lungs what happens it is sent to the pulmonary vein with this oxygenated blood goes to the goes to the left ventricle left ventricle now pumps the blood to the uh, uh, through the aorta to the different parts of the body so after that the body organs are receiving this blood so you can see main artery which is called aorta has the responsibility to distribute the blood to the different parts of the body my dear students somewhere what happens when the blood has to come from the cells to the blood vessels then it is two two uh, small small cells are there so those two small cells uh, are not coming in contact with the arteries or veins directly so they are actually taking help of capillaries capillaries are the finest blood vessels so the capillaries are working as junction between arteries and veins somewhere between veins and cells somewhere between cells and arteries so in the all the three areas wherever the space is very less and arteries and veins cannot be accommodated there then in that case this junction kind of purpose is served by the capillaries so that's why the capillaries are shown here and also here right this is how you have come to know about your working of the pump that is your heart i hope this concept is clear and let's move up to the different part my dear students generally your body has got four chamber your heart has got four chamber so in this four chambered heart what is special about it the blood has to go to the heart two times once deoxygenated blood goes in the systemic circulation and then oxygenated blood goes to into the pulmonary circulation so in that case there are two kinds of circulation taking place in your body once deoxygenated blood comes to your heart and again oxygenated blood comes to your heart this movement is actually possible by what because your your human body is actually what um, is a warm blooded animal body so warm blooded animals use their own energy and they, uh, they this energy uh, they can uh, manage their body temperature irrespective of the outer surrounding and for that purpose they have to separate the blood oxygenated and the deoxygenated blood so in order to do that their body is separated by the septum so uh, how uh, for that purpose uh, to fulfill that purpose the circulation of the blood circulation pro uh, purpose they have to uh, allow the blood to enter the heart two times one is the pulmonary circulation pulmonary circulation when the blood moves from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart this process when from the right ventricle the blood goes to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries and then it is getting deox uh, de getting oxygenated over there and after that what happens then it gets oxygenated and comes back when it comes back then again it comes to the blood moves from the heart to the rest of the body and back to the heart again so that's how it is called systemic circulation since two types of circulation taking place are taking place in our body so that is why your body circulation your circulation or the blood circulation in our circulatory system is called systemic or sorry double circulation our body is said to be having double circulation so you can see here the black color line shows a right auricle receiving the blood and it comes to the right ventricle and then it's clearly shown that it goes to the to the lungs to the pulmonary artery and by back from the pulmonary vein it receives the blood and then it comes to the to the veins and then ventricle pumps the blood to the different parts of the body my dear students so the twice movement of the blood takes place in our blood in our body in our heart that is why our blood circulation is said to be as a double circulation so hope this slide is clear to your body 
blood travels twice through the heart in one complete cycle and what is this cycle let me tell you one thing that once your blood is being received by the heart so at that time there is one auricular contraction right then after that after the auricular contraction within a fraction of a second ventricular contraction takes place right so when the auricular contraction takes place then it is called systole and the ventricular contraction takes place then it is called diastole and that one systole plus one diastole creates one complete heartbeat receiving of the blood and pumping of the blood complete one cycle during this two events are taking place one contraction of the auricle two contraction of the ventricle so auricular contraction causes systole and ventricular contraction causes diastole so systolic one systole plus one diastole makes one heartbeat and this you can count how many heartbeat you feel you can count you can just take a stethoscope and allow yourself to count the beats per minute if you are a healthy and a normal person you will know and you have to tell me what is the number of heartbeat in a normal person per minute i won't tell you here right so my dear students this one cycle to complete one cycle the blood travels twice in the heart right so one heartbeat is equal to one systole plus one diastole right here after learning about the heart you also come to know something new what is that there are variety of hearts in the different types of actually the, the very um, you can say diversity of the types of heart in the different types of animals we start from the different as i said to you that humans and uh, humans especially uh, are the mammals right so the, the mammals and birds there are five classes you had studied in your uh, class 9 chordata phylum so in which the two file two classes like mammals and birds which are apes generally are having four chambered heart this four chambered heart with two auricles and ventricles each right opening through valves yes there to both the chambers are opening through the valves both sides are separated by septum to avoid mixing of blood and what does it help in this uh, when they do not mix their blood then what does it help in this provides sufficient supply of oxygen as they need more energy to maintain their body temperature they are warm blooded so they have to maintain their body temperature and in order to do that they have to avoid mixing of the blood so that oxygen supply can be maximum apart from this amphibians and reptiles they are generally cold blooded so they and they do not need much energy to to manage their body temperature so they are three chambered out of which they sometimes also allow mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood because their ventricle is not actually uh, guided by the septum so they have got uh, some scope of mixing of this oxygenated or deoxygenated blood as they do not need much or do not use much energy to maintain their body temperature their body temperature is same as that of the surrounding so if surrounding's temperature changes their behavior also changes but it's not so in us surrounding temperature changes no matter how much but we have to manage our body temperature right so this is the difference in the cold blooded and the warm blooded animals right other than that our um, another another class of the animal that is fish fishes have two chamber blood is oxygenated in the gills directly directly they are in they are entering uh, getting the blood directly in oxygenated form you can check out this is the this is the two chambered uh, heart of the fish this is the two ch uh, three chambered of heart of the three chambered heart of the amphibians and this is your four chambered heart of birds and mammals 1 2 and 3 two chambered uh, three chambered and four chambered okay so this is the circulatory paths shown in a summarized way in five classes of chordata or vertebrates okay so here moving on when we move on generally student what happens once the blood 
the force that blood exerts against the wall of a vessel is called blood pressure i had told you that when the ventricle presses itself or contracts then the blood goes to the different parts of the body then it has to move with a very great pressure so that pressure which is built up on the arterial wall that is called blood pressure this pressure is much greater in arteries than in veins because veins are the collecting vessels and these have to and the uh, arteries are the distributing vessels so they have to do it with a great pressure and power this pressure of the blood inside the artery during ventricular systole systole means auricular contraction is called systolic pressure and the pressure in artery during the ventricular diastole that is called the auricular relaxation when the auricle relaxes ventricle contracts when the ventricle con relaxes the auricle contracts so alternate contraction and relaxation hmm? so systole means auricular contraction and diastole means auricular uh, relaxation so here uh, um, you can also call auricular contraction is called systole ventricular contraction is called diastole so in the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure is called um, this this is what we take up as a blood pressure so the pressure of blood inside the artery during ventricular systole is called systolic pressure and the pressure in the artery during the ventricular diastole is called diastolic pressure the normal systolic pressure is 120 of hg and diastolic pressure is 80 mm of hg you can check out how this is done this figure is very important to observe that blood pressure is 120 to 80 in the arteries this is the sphygmomanometer the device which is used the blood pressure is measured with an instrument called a sphygmomanometer high blood pressure is called hypertension and is caused by the constriction of arterioles sometimes what happens your uh, arterioles are uh, very narrow due to which uh, blood flow is uh, slow and that causes low blood pressure which results in increased resistance to the blood flow it can lead to the rupture of an artery and internal bleeding too so low blood um, higher blood pressure and the low blood pressure is actually uh, well sorry there was a mistake that high blood pressure is caused due to restriction in the flow of blood uh, constriction in the arteries due to which what happens the um, brain gets irritated and so much of uh, complications take place in our circulatory system it can lead to the internal bleeding also and the rupture of the artery also i hope this has cleared your uh, blood circulation process uh, topic so let's move on my dear students once we go to My dear students, these all the things when we have learnt, then we come to know that there are so may, uh, many food nutrients have which have been actually transported to our body, right? So uh, we are actually complex living organisms, huh? So um, is the um, is the transportation system same in all the group of living things? I think no, right? So for that purpose, we have to make our concepts little clear. In the transportation in plants, we have to look up what is the importance to study here is that this importance uh, is small plants and cells are very close to each other, right? So this they are close to each other where transportation can be done by diffusion. But if cells are far from each other as in large plants, diffusion is not enough for this purpose. You know, because mode of nutrition, actually mode of transportation actually depends on energy needs and this energy needs are different for different kinds of plant, which have got different plant body design. The plant body design differs from one to another. Now these plants, they do not move. They have large number of dead cells also. So what happens? They have less energy needs and since they have less energy needs, hence use relatively low tra slow transport system the transport system is also slow so this plant transport system uh, that moves energy stores uh, from the leaves and raw materials from the roots this is done by the very independently organized conducting tubes so these conducting tubes are actually called xylem tubes and phloem tubes whereas the xylem tubes conduct water and minerals obtained from the root to the or soil to the leaves whereas the phloem tubes conduct food from the leaves to other parts of the plant well movement of the water and minerals from the xylem is unidirectional unidirectional means it is in upward direction whereas the movement of food or nutrients from the leaves 
to the different parts of the plant is actually bidirectional or multidirectional because you don't know that which part of the body needs food so they have to move toward the branches also move toward the stem also move to the roots also if different locations starch is being stored after production of the food food has to be stored in the different parts of the body in some plants it is stored in the leaves in some plants it is stored in the seeds in some plants it is stored in the stem or flowers or fruits so due to this what happens their places have to be their places have to be uh, different that's why the direction of the movement is also different that's why the movement of the phloem products is bidirectional let's see what is what happens in the xylem transport dear students as you recall the concept of uh, class 9 you will see xylem is a complex permanent tissue it contains certain in special cells they consist of vessels and tracheids right so these vessels and tracheids first of all how do they re receive the water and minerals they receive water and minerals first of all through the diffusion and then diff this water and mineral through diffusion enters the root hairs which are in the direct contact with the soil and these root hairs now are connected with the root main root system so this water and mineral is being now sucked up okay who is facilitating this suction this suction is being facilitated by the transpiration happening in the transpiration happening in the leaves this you can see transpiration happening in the leaves when this transpiration happens in the leaves then it creates a suction pool that pulls the water and minerals upward in through the through the tubes that tubes are made by tracheids and vessels well vessels elements and fiber elements tracheids these all the elements are end to end connected in the xylem tube and hence it is allowing the movement of water and minerals in the upward direction this movement of water and minerals in the upward direction is called ascent of sap you can see this ascent of sap my dear students this xylem conducts water and minerals from the root to leaves now let's see the other part here you can also see that once the photosynthesis is done then after doing all the photosynthesis the food has to be transported to the different parts of the plant this different parts of the plants have to receive the food the, then who will take it again the severe is phloem phloem conducts what food synthesized in the leaves to the different parts of the plant in the previous slide xylem causes ascent of sap but the phloem does translocation you can see this translocation is done by the phloem transport so here what does phloem consist of phloem consists of the sieve tube and it also consists of the companion cell you recall the concept of previous class right they contain sieve tube and then companion cells the translocation in phloem is achieved by utilizing energy they need energy because the food has to go in the bi-directional process different areas so that needs energy they use energy how let us see the materials like sucrose is transferred into the phloem tissue type tissue using energy from atp okay now due to this energy uh, due to this what happens one osmotic pressure of the tissue is built up osmotic pressure of this of the tissue causing water to move into it now this causes movement of the material in the phloems to tissue which have less pressure and then what happens due to the difference in the pressure this allows the phloem to move the materials according to the plants needs here is again you have to recall the concept of uh, osmos osmosis topic in class 9 so you had seen the hypertonic and hypotonic movement how does the solution take place through one lower concentration to the higher concentration or higher concentration to the lower concentration osmotic pressure of the tissue causing water to move into it and then moves the material in the phloem to tissue which have less pressure and this allows the phloem to move material according to the plant's need my dear students these are the two tubes called which help this uh, movement of water and minerals from the root to the leaves and back and again the phloem helps movement of translocation of food from the leaves to the different parts of the body this is another comparative study of xylem transport and the phloem transport please have a look once 
and you can pause a little uh, uh, next time you can just pause it and observe the total arrow mark what happens and what is the structural and physical difference in the xylem vessel as well as in the phloem vessel well my dear students thank you for uh, um, having a uh, time with us and uh, you have observed this i think you all have uh, taken uh, the utmost concentration to this topic here the conclusion of this topic is that whether it is living thing or non living thing in both the cases movement of the or transportation of the material is done and if it is the simple living thing then diffusion is enough because the cells are close to each other and so and cells are in direct contact with the air and surrounding whereas if it is not in contact then they have to uh, be adapted to the different uh, transportation system as like in human beings in human beings are the complex organisms where this uh, movement is so facilitated by the well developed transportation system that is called circulatory system uh, while in the plants it has been uh, developed as the xylem transport as well as the phloem transport thank you have a nice day stay safe stay healthy